All right, hello, PsychU community. My name is Gerard Zitnick, and I'm from the Otsuka Medical Affairs team. I will serve as the moderator for this exciting discussion featuring Dr. James Murrow and Dr. Laura Rowland. Dr. Murrow is an associate professor of psychiatry and neuroscience and the director of the Depression and Anxiety Center for Discovery and Treatment at the Eichen School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He received his medical degree from Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, completed his residency training and research fellowship in experimental therapeutics and clinical neuroscience and mood disorders at Mount Sinai. He obtained a PhD in clinical research methodology and biostatistics from Mount Sinai. Dr. Murrow conducts clinical and translational research aimed at understanding the biological basis of mood and anxiety disorders. Dr. Rowland is an associate professor in the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, MPRC, Department of Psychiatry at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She is the director of the Chemical Imaging Corps, housed within the Neuroimaging Research Program at the MPRC, and the co-director of the MPRC Postdoctoral Training Program. Dr. Rowland received her PhD in Experimental Psychology, Behavioral Neuroscience from the University of New Mexico. Her research focuses on proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy studies of glutamatergic and GABAergic function, and bioenergetic alterations in schizophrenia and related disorders. Over the next hour, our speakers will be discussing the role of the glutamatergic system plays in the brain and the pathophysiology of schizophrenia and mood disorders, as well as some of the interesting research emerging around glutamate in these conditions. The information provided is intended for your educational benefits only. No CMEs or CEU credits are offered. It is not intended as, nor it is a substitute for medical care or advice as a professional diagnosis. Users seeking medical advice should consult with their physician or other healthcare professional. While conducting this discussion, our speakers aim to provide you with information that is accurate, not misleading, scientifically rigorous, and does not promote Otsuka products. So without further ado, I'll give the floor over to our first speaker, Dr. Murrow, who will begin with a brief introduction on glutamate. Great. Well, thank you so much, and uh, really great to be part of this exciting discussion. So let me start out by just talking a little bit about the, the basics of glutamate, which many people may already know, but, but just to get everyone on the same page, you know, glutamate, it's a neurotransmitter. It's made throughout the body by almost every cell. It's made in the brain. And it really controls the point-to-point -point communication for brain cells. And it's the primary excitatory transmitter, neurotransmitter in the brain. That means when brain cells release a glutamate, it will diffuse across the synapse, bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, and trigger an excitatory response in the next cell. Now, on the slide, you see this sort of on-off switch cartoon moving from left to right across the top of the slide with GABA, which is sort of the... The, the, it makes up the glutamate GABA sort of a yin-yang where GABA controls and is the primary inhibitory transmitter in the brain. So when cells release GABA, it causes the recipient of that signal, a neighboring cell, to tend to fire less or electrically quiet down. And it's the balance of these that control, fundamentally really provide the control for all functioning uh, in the brain. And then the transmitter systems that we'll talk about a little bit later in the talk the classic monoamine systems tend to sort of regulate this. But this, these are responsible for the point-to-point the, the -point communications. Also, it'll come up later in the talk. In addition to that, glutamate has a very important sort of separate um, activity in the brain, and that is control synaptic plasticity to, to a great degree. And as we'll hear more, both in depression as well as schizophrenia, there's a lot of evidence to suggest there are deficits in synaptic plasticity. Um, so glutamate really plays a, a key role in those two areas. And um, next slide, we'll get into a little more of the, the details. Okay, so drilling down a little bit, uh, we talked about glutamate being released from the presynaptic neuron, diffuses across the synapse into the postsynaptic, where it binds to a variety of receptors, which, as you may know, are, are proteins or aggregates of proteins embedded within the, the membranes of postsynaptic cells. And essentially, it's the interaction of glutamate as a neurotransmitter with these receptors that triggers whatever biological effects are going to be in the subsequent cell. Now, there's lots of, of, of different glutamate receptors, actually. The, the, this, what you see on the slide, is really just a, an overview. But, but receptors can be put into two buckets. So on the left, we've grouped what we're calling the ionotropic glutamate receptors. And on the right, we've grouped 
what's termed metabotropic glutamate receptors. So let's look at the left. These all essentially are aggregates of proteins, usually tetrameric proteins, uh, uh, aggregations of, of four proteins that form a channel. And the channel is resting, typically closed, in the cell membrane. And when glutamate or other so-called coagonists would bind to these ionotropic receptors, the channel opens and current flows in. Uh, typically, that current is carried by sodium, but can also be a calcium. And the immediate, again, talking about that point-to-point -point effect, the excitatory sort of immediate effect of glutamate binding to these uh, receptors, the channel opening, and sodium rushing into the cell is to tend to cause the cell to fire or to excite the cell. These receptors are also very important in the other process I mentioned, which is activity-dependent plasticity, uh, because calcium and other agents enter the cell and have been shown to affect a longer-term synaptic a structure and sensitivity. And in particular, we'll direct our attention to the, the third from the left of the ionotropic receptors. That's the NMDA receptor. Very important, complicated receptor been shown for many, many years in basic neuroscience to be key for an important form of neuronal plasticity called long-term long potentiation. You can see the numbers underneath those, the glue A1 through 4, the for the NMDA, the glue N1. These are all different types or members of proteins that can aggregate in all different ways. So when someone says there's an NMDA receptor, you have to ask, well, what's it made of? Where is it located in the brain? And the more we know about the basic biology, all these details are extremely important, um, which we'll come back to. Just touching briefly on the other group of receptors that we'll mention briefly in the presentation, these are the metabotropic. These are G protein club coupled receptors. They're seven transmembrane spanning receptors. And these are very, they're quite different than ion channels. And these are actually in the family of receptors that most of the drugs you're used to thinking about in psychiatry um, whether they affect dopamine or serotonin, it's almost always G protein coupled. And so these tend to regulate cellular processes over a longer term uh, time span and can be very important um, in terms of modulation of cells. I'll just point out briefly the, and they're grouped um, into three groups. The group two and three that you see at the bottom right of the slide are very important for actually they typically exist presynaptically on glutamatergic, on glutamate cells, and they actually regulate how much glutamate those cells uh, manufacture and release. So that sort of gets at a theme that you're going to hear throughout today, which is that there has to be very tight control over exactly how much glutamate, how much GABA, and where is it in, in the brain. And these cells are, uh, excuse me, these receptors are important for that. Okay, this is Dr. Roland speaking. So I'm going to talk about the glutamate synapse. So this is an illustration of the glutamate synapse, which is also known as the tripartite synapse because there's three cells involved. We have the presynaptic neuron on the left, we have the postsynaptic neuron on the right, and then we have the astrocyte. And all three cells are intimately involved in the glutamate-glutamine cycle. So glutamate is released from the presynaptic neuron, and that's illustrated in blue, and it is released into the synaptic cleft where it can diffuse to the postsynaptic neuron. It can bind to the ionotropic receptors that Dr. Moreau discussed, the NMDA receptor, kinate receptor, the AMPA receptor, and also the metabotropic group one receptor. So when it binds, it actually, changes the voltage of the postsynaptic neuron, and as a result, it can cause downstream signaling and neurotransmission. In a healthy brain, glutamate doesn't like to hang out in the synapse or bind to the receptors for a long time because it can cause excitotoxicity. It can be detrimental to the system. So there's a system in place whereby glutamate is rapidly taken up by the astrocyte and converted to glutamine, that's an inactive metabolite, and it is then shuttled back to the presynaptic neuron where it is converted back to glutamate. And that completes the glutamate-glutamine cycle.
So the only technique where one can non-invasively measure glutamate and glutamine levels in the brain is with proton magnetic spectroscopy. So this is a technique that uses a regular MRI machine or MRI scanner, but instead of getting images, which most people are used to looking at, you obtain what is called a spectrum. So that is the illustration on the right. And this particular spectrum was obtained from a box or voxel, which we call it, that was placed in the anterior cingulate region and we obtained a signal and hence a spectrum. The spectrum has peaks and the peaks represent different chemicals in the brain, including glutamate and glutamine. So there's been many studies, spectroscopy studies, of mood disorders and of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders investigating glutamate and glutamine concentrations. And essentially there are there have been found differences in these levels in different brain areas. And our hope for using this technique is that potentially one day we're going to be able to identify biomarkers that could serve as treatment targets, also predict illness onset, and also predict illness exacerbation. Okay, great. So thank you, Dr. Roland. So let's get into a little bit about some of the evidence or thinking about the role of glutamate in, in depression and, and other mood disorders. So, but before we do that, let's just review what's the prevailing theory of depression in terms of its cause, uh, but also importantly, how we think about um, how we might uh, treat the illness and how we might identify or develop uh, new medications. And as, 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 as most of you, I'm sure, are, are well aware, still, uh, really, the, the dominant theory that is now many decades old regarding depression is known as the monomine hypothesis of depression or the monomine theory of depression. And as you can see on the slide, essentially, the key feature of this theory is that some sort of deficiency or lack of monomine signaling in the brain or transmitters is an important cause of depression. And when we say mono means, we're talking about serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine primarily. And just to review this, what's been an important and to some extent continues to be an important sort of scaffolding to how we, how we think about depression, what's the basis for it? Well, there's quite a bit of indirect evidence that mono means have something to do with depression. But here on the slide, it points out probably two of the most important ones. The first was that, and this goes back to probably um, at least the 1950s, when it was observed that certain types of medicines, for example, that would be prescribed for hypertension, actually led to the emergence of depression in otherwise healthy individuals. And it was later found that those medicines tended to deplete the body and the brain of monomines such as, such as dopamine um, and others. So that was an important clue. And then another one, kind of the flip side of that, was it was observed that some medicines used for completely other reasons actually seemed to treat an underlying depression if someone was given it, for example, an anti-tuberculosis drug or an antibiotic that later was found to actually increase the levels of monomines. And, and, and these are drugs that led to originally the monomine oxidase inhibitors, the tricyclics, and then later developing SSRIs and, and SNRIs. So that's the kind of where we stand. And then the question is, so where does glutamate, you know, fit into this? It's a little bit of a text-heavy slide, but what we wanted to do here was give you some of the high-level evidence in these different buckets, the indirect evidence, evidence for actually alterations in glutamate levels, and then some evidence for alterations in the genetics or gene expression and the best way we felt to do this was just to kind of kind of lay it out here. So let me walk you through, starting at the top of the slide, with with the indirect evidence. Um, one is is that if you look at the brain of individuals who who either died by by suicide or, or other reason that had depression, they actually show uh, abnormalities in some of the cells in the brain that we knew are, know are really important 
for, for glutamate signaling. And as Dr. Rowland mentioned, the so-called tripartite synapse, you have, the, you have the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic, but then glial cells, that's the third cell, plays a really important role in, in, in breaking down and controlling levels of glutamate and recycling a glutamine and glutamate. And it's been observed that in patients suffering from depression uh, or who die by suicide, they have reduced levels of, of glial cells in their brain. So that's one, a, a one hint. Moving to the next box, oh, and there's also, let me make one other point in that first box, is that there's been links between medications used for bipolar or depression that modulate glutamate that have been shown to have some, some efficacy. And I'll also say that in, in animal models of, say, depression, it's been shown that if you treat an animal with, let's say, four weeks, two to four weeks of a standard monoamine agent like any of those, then actually you see changes in the glutamate system uh, along the same time course as you start to see reversal of those depressive behaviors. Uh, moving to the middle box and um, picking up on what Dr. Rowland said about the use of this important technology with brain imaging to be able to look at uh, glutamate levels, Meta-analyses now show that there are clearly altered levels of glutamate in the brain in individuals with both bipolar um, and unipolar depression compared to healthy controls, um, and that the mood state they're in could tend to affect uh, those levels. Um, and actually, some earlier studies also suggested that you can look for glutamate in the bloodstream, in the plasma, and, that th and those are also abnormal um, in patients that have mood disorders. And finally, some studies can even look at cerebral spinal fluid to give a little bit of a more direct look into what might be going on in the brain or in the central nervous system. And here, too, there are studies of um, alterations in glutamate levels in patients with mood disorders. Finally, in the last box, there's a little bit of data. You know, the, the, the field of psychiatric genetics, as you know, is, is, is growing by leaps and bounds, and disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar are, are gaining traction. In unipolar depression, it's been a little less clear, but small and candidate gene studies have indicated abnormalities in genes that code for, for example, I mentioned, let's take the NMDA receptor made up of four proteins. It's been shown that at least some of the genes that code for those proteins that make up the NMDA glutamate receptor um, are altered in, or confer risk to, uh, to depression. And, and as I mentioned, in addition to, uh, I mentioned looking at brains of, of patients who die with depression, either by suicide or other means, they show alterations in glial cells. They also show alterations in the actual concentrations of some of these glutamate-related proteins, like the proteins that make up the NMDA receptor um, or the AMPA receptor.